Hey, we're back. It's the Sam and Cole podcast. Once again, this is uh, Tuesday, July 22nd, 2014. Sam Kavaris and Cole oh, Pepper. 2014? Wait, hang on. Let me... I just <laughs> change my calendar. You better change that. Um, we, uh, no doubt... I think Black Creek Outfitters, yeah, by the way. That's course. right. Yeah, I'll get to that. The uh, But the uh, the interesting thing is, is that uh, I think, Cole, this is probably the, the beginning of some pretty regular podcasts by you yeah. and I yes. commenting on um, everything that um, we find important. And if you don't find it important, that's okay. We do. Skip to the uh, next one. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. As, uh, as Cole said, brought to you by, as we have been for the last few months, Black Creek Outfitters. Go by and see Joe Butler or John or um, Liz. I saw Liz Butler in there the other day. I mean, just uh, they've got everything in there. Obviously, some people are thinking about going back for back to school already. I think it's a you know it's got a, everything you need probably except for pencils and papers. But uh, uh, stop in at Black Creek Outfitters and I know Cole has uh, got some of those tech shirts. Yeah. I'm going to go in and buy some some of those Solomon shoes. There's there's a lot of stuff in there that uh, that you wouldn't expect to see at an outfitter. And uh, the most important thing I think about that place is when you go in, somebody will ask you in about ten seconds, "Can I help you?" Which I and think the big is, green egg, which may be more important and, than that. And they have the big green egg. Cole, the uh, the Jaguars. Kind of quasi reported, half kind of quasi reported. The uh, the rookies had to be there Monday, and I thought it was interesting. The rookies had to be there by nine o'clock in the morning. This yeah. was not a leisurely, hey, show up Monday. Now you got to be there Monday for a battery of tests, pictures, conditioning tests, you know that kind of stuff. And um, there were some veterans that showed up. The interesting part about that call is is that people think, oh, these guys, these veterans, they're guys that live in town. The Jaguars aren't putting them up. Chad Henney is. You know, he's doing the right thing. He's there. Cecil Shorts is there to kind of work with some of the young guys. But they're going home at night. The rookies, on the other hand, they're captured. They're, they're captured. The hotel captured. They're there. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. So here's what we're going to do over the next three podcasts. I want to give everybody kind of a preview here. We're going to take the top seven story. We had going to do six, but we couldn't decide which of the top seven we were going to boot out of the top seven. So we'll do three different podcasts here, each of them featuring two, or in the last case, three, the big finish. Uh, of the, uh, we think, most significant storylines entering camp for the Jaguars, and we'll talk about those. And then uh, if you want to give some feedback, you certainly can on Twitter, Sam at Sam Kavaris, me at Cole Pepper. So let's start with these two in this episode. It'll be, did they solve the pass rush, and is the stadium experience going to be everything they want? Those are our two topics we're going to get into. Let's start with the pass rush. Uh, obviously an area, Sam, that they paid a lot of attention to in the offseason, defensive line in particular bringing in Chris Clemens and Ziggy Hood and Red Bryant, uh, saying goodbye to Jason Babin. This has been a team that hasn't really had a pass rush. I mean, you go back to 99 when they were ahead of everybody, you know, 21 nothing in the second quarter, and uh, they got after the quarterback then. But this has really never been a, a, a franchise that has had a fearsome pass rush. They might have a guy having a good year here, a guy having a good year there. Uh, in Seattle, Gus Bradley really focused on putting pressure on the quarterback, and now more than ever, you have to put pressure on the quarterback. So did they solve the pass rush this offseason? And with the guys they brought in and the guys they have remaining, like uh, Branch and Ifalawalu is a part of the picture, what, do they have what it takes to be more than just a middle-of-the-road pass rush team? Can they get after the quarterback? First of all, Cole, you're exactly right in that they, you know, this franchise has historically never been able to solve this problem. I mean, you can go back to Tony Brackens. You can go back to Kevin Hardy, who was the uh, first-round pick in the second year because this is what they tried to address because they thought Kevin Hardy was the next Lawrence Taylor type who would pressure the quarterback, um, whether it has been Tyson Alualu or yeah, Bobby uh, McCray. I Bobby mean. McCray they drafted, uh, Derek Henry, or I mean... Um, um, Harvey. They, they also Derek, drafted Derek guys Harvey. like uh, uh, Brent Hawkins and Jorge Cordova to play the yeah. you know designated pass rusher, and it never it's never happened. Out. Yeah, they've, ne they've never been able to do that. So um, upgraded, absolutely solved. I don't think so. I think that uh, you have some very solid players there, and I think it is very um, astute of them to go at it in this way, and you can you can do this when you convince your owner that you're still not going to win, but 
um, the next thing they must get is someone who is a can't miss yeah, pass elite rush pass elite guy from the edge not not just a guy who's going to have six or eight or nine and a half a year a guy who has a potential has 16 a year you know that they, kind of guy they, they need either a Jared Allen or I'll tell you the guy who you know not that you can find these guys on, uh, just anywhere but the a guy who would fit this scheme perfectly would be a guy like a Derek Thomas who mm -hmm. is sort of a hybrid defensive end outside linebacker but just has an amazing ability to get to the quarterback and of course I remember I covered the Chiefs and, and Thomas was there with Neil Smith on the other side I don't think any of the guys they have have that I think Branch probably has the best potential to put up big numbers year after year but he's only done it for half a year at best you know not and even that, and he's, he's the absolute linchpin to the taking the next step in that position because you've got guys like Bryant, you've got guys like Clemens who have experience in the league, you know what they can do, you know what they're going to produce, but you, you've got that wild card in Branch that some people say the 49ers wanted to know, what the hell happened to Branch? He's all of a sudden a different player, and, and that's good because if he can produce in that level for an entire year, it changes the whole equation. Yeah. For what you have to ask Paul Puzlesny to do, what you have to ask guys in the, you know, guys like Jonathan Cyprian to do. I think they're going to be getting sacks more by scheme than by a guy just being great at getting after the quarterback. And one thing that throws a little bit of a monkey wrench into this, you know, they're trying to introduce this auto position, which would be yeah. the the, lead, the opposite side, the guy a Leo on the opposite side, but he'd be a linebacker safety. And Dakota Watson was a the guy they really wanted to be that, but he's not healthy right now. Uh, they've talked about, you know, using a defensive back who maybe uh, can can come off the edge. Of the, they're inventing this new position, basically, in the National Football League, hoping that this auto position will will do what the Leo did in in Seattle and work with the Leo. Uh, that's interesting. But but this is a this is going to be a scheme pass rush more than it's going to be a player pass rush. It's not to say you you can do it with just anybody. You have to have the right players. But yeah. it's not going to be having that Lawrence Taylor, Jared Allen, you know, whomever coming off the edge. Right now, right now, right now. I, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care what kind of scheme you come up with. It comes down to beat the guy in front of you, you know. And that's well. Sometimes and, it's confuse the guy in front of you. Well, at, but at at one at some point in a game, I mean, how many times have you and I sat in the press box and been watching the game and looked at each other and just go, somebody here has got to make a play. Sure, somebody's and it will got, come down to that. Somebody's got to make a play, that. right? Yep. Yep. And that and that's what you need. And you have more confidence that a guy like Clemens or Bryant is going to be able to make that play. You know, the other wow. thing that that helps the pass rush is not trailing in the game. You know, <laughs> uh, get it to <laughs> not the, being down twenty-one nothing. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, you've got to exactly. be able. You've got to be able to put them in a, sit, the other team in a sit. Now you'll see teams throwing more now, even with the lead. But uh, if if you're down you know, 13 points in the third quarter, uh, you're probably not going to see teams dropping back a lot, uh, you know, right. and, and so certainly first and second down become big for that as well, try to give them in a second long, third and long situations. So if I were to give you the over-under on sacks this year, if I put it at 35, which is slightly more than two a game, is that too high a number for you? Yeah, I'd take, I'd still take the under. 32? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. 32 is a good number. It's yeah. right in that in that region, isn't it? It yeah. feels like it. if they're it going really to be successful, happens. it's going to have to be higher than that. Higher. It's got to be 40 and above. Yeah. But um, and but and which means, as you just said, they're not trailing by 13 or 25 in the third quarter. Right. That's they're right. Okay. they're in they're in the game. That's uh, that's that's one of our topics. The other one is the stadium experience, and we're taping this on Tuesday night, as Sam mentioned. Uh, on Saturday, uh, we'll be in the stadium to watch the uh, Fulham DC United match and the Carrie Underwood concert and the unveiling of the scoreboards. And if you've driven past the stadium or been on the Matthews or Hart Bridge over the last week, week and a half, you've probably seen some uh, testing going on. It you know, looks like uh, uh, close seen out of the third kind. Seen out of close you know, counters. That's exactly right. right. Uh, uh, seen I expect to go by and hear it go, do, 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 do. <laughs> right. Or somebody building up uh, <laughs> Devil's Tower with mashed potatoes. <laughs> Uh, right. For those of you who are younger, uh, you can you can probably find that on YouTube. You can Google that, yeah, somehow. Yeah. But uh, 
the stadium mm-hmm. experience has got to be more than just the scoreboards. And they've done a lot of things to try to enhance that. Uh, and, of course, you have the pools and everything else. And uh, hats off to the Hunt Elkins team who have done, uh, I think, an amazing job of getting that. I mean, they have put some resources to getting those things done in time for Saturday's uh, unveiling. But how much are the scoreboards going to change the the game day experience, the stadium experience, and will it do what they want it to do, which is basically convince people, not just this year where they're selling a lot of tickets based on hope of the team and, and hope of the uh, of the stadium being better than the whole thing, but how much will it convince people, hey, this is better than my living room? It's the next step. This isn't the, this isn't the last thing, and, and I think it's an important step. Uh, it created a buzz, created some excitement, as you said, created some more ticket sales. Uh, whether it's the the luxury seating, the swimming pools, the cabanas, the 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 four tops that you'll be able to that are sold out. Four tops the, are playing halftime. <laughs> not the original. Or younger, you can Google the four tops. Yeah. Okay, the you know these are <clears throat> these are all things that are in that next step, and I think I uh, you and I talked about this the other day, maybe not in our podcast. It's all going to come down to this too. Mm-hmm. Is, and those of you who are watching this on video, I'm holding up my smartphone. This one's not very smart. But the, the, the phone itself is where you're going to be able to have this experience. You're going to be able to log on to the Jaguar Stadium app. You're going to be able to not only order food, but you're going to be able to watch your own replay. You're going to be able to uh, pull up your fantasy team right here on your own smartphone, all through the Jaguar Stadium app. And that, you know, and that to me is the, the you know, when you look at, the big scoreboards, when you look at the, um, the enhancements to the stadium, it all certainly is being timed for the team to be competitive as well. I mean, you can do all this stuff. Yep. If the team goes 4-12, and 12, you know, then, then it, doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. And I will also say, Sam, just to do a little science experiment here, pick up your not-so-smart phone yeah. and put it, hold it in front of your face where you would have it, to, right. to to watch a video or something, you know, right there. It's, yep. it's six inches in front of your nose. Yep, that is a much bigger field division than any scoreboard is going to going to be. Right. The question is about can they? I think two things. One, can they drive content to that? Not just to have the content, but get it there. I know they've upgraded the Wi-Fi, but I I think there's another step to this as well about really oh, absolutely. creating you know an encapsulated Wi-Fi there. And then number two, and this is an issue that. Uh, University of Florida and SEC teams, Oklahoma State, uh, have been looking to the MLS to, to, to see how they've done this. The, at Alabama, they did studies, and they found that one of the reasons why students weren't coming out or were leaving at halftime is because their cell phone battery had run down. Yeah, right. So at some point, you're going to need to have either charging stations very uh, readily available, and there are some of these neat little uh, platforms that have uh, like a little – Charging kiosks like you'd see in the in the uh, airport or something, where you right. have all these different attachments, you plug it in. Can you or hold something. for a second while I go do this? And yeah, can go you, do. Can you go edit do this again? Yeah, we'll edit it out. We'll go do. Go. I'll go be to right back. And we'll come back. Yeah. Be right back. All right.
I haven't talked to him for a while. I, I, I try to talk to an anchor unless I need to. Right. Tonight, obviously, I mean, we all have to tell him that we got to Yeah. We got to a point, I was sitting with him like, I was in the car, maybe this morning, and he was here, so now it's a pen taking on a man. So there's that. Yeah. Crazy how much like all these and then you just That's why I have a really concern about Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. There you are. There we are. All right, you're back. Point I was making: they're going to have to find a way to solve these problems, including powering the phones. Whether it's having mm -hmm. little power stations or having you know USB cords powered up through the chairs, that's a whole other thing. Again, this if you're going to go fully into this thing, it is not going to be an inexpensive proposition. And if you're going to try to lead the way in the National Football League, uh, it's it's going to take some major overhauls to really. Uh, the question is, do you want to continue to be the guinea pig, or do you want to do a couple of things and then see how other, whether it's NFL, college football, what have you, solves issues and then say, all right, that's the right way to do it. And it's interesting because Shad Khan is a guy who wants to, you know, he's he's thinking uh, how to do this better. He's instilled that uh, thought process, how do we do this better for the game day experience. But it's very expensive to be the first in on anything, and I, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the years. Very expensive, and so consequently the Jaguars have the right guy writing the checks to do that uh, because I think he sees a payoff long-term for that. Uh, and I remember and I remember I was there, and you might have been there too, when Shad told me that the Jaguars were going to be what he called the whiteboard for the NFL, mm -hmm. right, in this, in this regard. And when Roger Goodell came to town two years ago, right after Shad took over the team, I asked him that specifically. You know, are the Jaguars going to be, as Shad calls it, the whiteboard? And he said, absolutely. We have a lot of things that, that, that Shad wants to try that we want to experiment with and figure out if it works. Now, a lot of these ideas are um, being used in much smaller proportions in not just the United States, in the EPL, uh, in the Olympics, you know, in a lot of different situations. And Shad has taken a lot of that and, uh, and kind of put it into that situation. When Baltimore opened their stadium originally, when the Ravens were awarded uh, back to Baltimore after the Colts left, um, when the Browns moved there, the, um, the, the way that the design of the scoreboard was, it's actually a big television screen. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to mimic the size of your television if you were sitting in your living room yeah. so that the person smaller in those days exactly that's what I'm saying yeah so so you know the perspective was supposed to be oh this, this is what that is well now all of a sudden you know if you don't have a 45 inch TV you might as well be watching it in a miniature mm -hmm. and and Goodell admits that high definition affordable large TV has become the biggest competitor to people going to the stadium and I will just say this, uh, and here is my wary bring down the conversation to note here. If Shad's going to pay for it, go for it. If mm -hmm. the NFL wants to supplement in some regard, go for it. If, if, mm -hmm. if the Jaguars are going to be a whiteboard uh, pilot program or some of these things, go for it. If it's taxpayer money, it brings in a whole different level of things. And Well, and, and, and I, I absolutely agree with you, but remember... Uh, and, you know, when Mark Lamping kind of flashed when you asked that question and blanched about it, um, he, he has a public relations issue when it comes to that because the Jaguars have not done a very good job in letting people know that there is already, there are already millions and millions of dollars earmarked for stadium improvements every year. This is not new money that's going to the Jaguars. This is money that 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 is earmarked for the stadium improvements. It's already there, and they're. But 
you know, though you're right. Any increase that the Jaguars want in their distribution of the pie of taxpayer dollars, it would ha you'd have to you'd have to convince me that that this was the right thing right now. And, and, and I think I'm right in this. Don't quote me on this, but I think I'm right in this. There is a there is a pool for stadium uh, for you know uh, uh, sports complex improvements. Mm -hmm. but when it happens at Everbank, then the baseball grounds that now has two uh, uh, tenants, tenants right? they're gonna say, well, hey, what about us? The arena mm -hmm. says, what about us? The uh, you know uh, the other facilities that are city owned uh, facilities, you know, equestrian center says, what about us? So. Uh, it, it, whether whether there's specifically allocated dollars or not, if those things start getting moved around in creative uh, accounting ways, it this is not just I mean, this is a one horse town in, in terms of of having one NFL team and having you know one of those uh, high major league uh, visibility franchises, but there there's a lot of politics involved here too when you start talking about public money. And I will I will give um, Lamping and the Jaguars credit in that they want the biggest piece of the pie they can get. You know what? That's their job. Sure. It's our job to be a watchdog about that. That's it's right. the city council's job to adjudicate that fairly. It's Peter Bregan's job to make sure that the ballpark is, and, and Mark Frisch's job to make sure that the ballpark's getting the, uh, the, the proper amount. It's Joel Lamp's job to make sure that the city is aware of what the needs are out there. So. Uh, I agree with you 100%, but I'm not going to fault a businessman who's trying to get an unfair share of the pie. I don't fault right? him. I'm just saying that, that, that it's it's not not that necessarily maybe it felt easy, but it's not going to be as easy next time. It's not going to no. feel as easy next time as it did the first I agree. time. I yeah. agree. And I was at the city council meeting when, when it was approved, and uh, obviously there was plenty of um, meetings before that, before and, and there was some discussion made. Um, but... Uh, I think the thing that put it over the top, is, uh, big part of it is that Shad was willing to write a $20 million check out of his own pocket. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. All right, those are our first two of our top seven storylines for the year heading into training camp. Next time up, we're going to talk about Luke Jokel and the wide receiving core and where that stands with the Jaguars as we continue our preview of training camp 2014 for the Jaguars right here on the Sam and Cole podcast brought to you by Black Creek Outfitters. Follow Sam on Twitter at Sam Kavaris. Follow me on Twitter at Cole Pepper. And we'll see you next time right here on the Sam and Cole podcast. All right. When is your hit here at 11? At about uh, 24. All right. We can certainly get one in and maybe two. All right. Uh, welcome back to the Sam and Cole podcast. We continue our preview of Jaguars Training Camp 2014 with our top seven storylines that we'll be looking at Heading into camp, uh, brought to you by Black Creek Outfitters. As always, if you're a barbecuer, the Big Green Egg, or do like I did, go out and pick out your training camp shirts or some of their high-tech shirts that they have out there. Uh, I'll be trying those on tomorrow and making mm -hmm. sure that uh, everything looks good getting ready for camp uh, and the heat out there. Last time we talked about the stadium experience and the pass rush, whether that was solved. Sam, this time out, let's talk about uh, Luke Jokel, rookie year, version 2.0, and uh, the wide receiving core that is suddenly... A, uh, a bigger question mark than maybe it was a week ago with the uh, revelation that Ace Sanders will not only uh, be suspended for four games, but that he'll skip training camp as he seeks uh, some sort of help for the undisclosed at this point uh, situation. It's something with the uh, league substance abuse policy, we assume. Let's start with the uh, wide receivers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a wide receiving core that could potentially look like Justin Blackman, Cecil Shorts, Ace Sanders, uh, Marquise Lee, Allen Robinson, Mike Brown. All right, maybe if that's the okay, top that's side. six. If that's I mean, the top six, right? There's only usually five active for games. But, right. So, but yeah. those are the so Justin Blackman, we're Gone. writing him off. Right. Ace Sanders, who not again, I think missing training camp maybe in his best interest. I you know I, I hope that he uses that time and gets the help he needs, but it's not going to help him on the field even when he comes back. Here's a guy who was the second leading receiver last year for the Jaguars with 51 catches. And so now all of a sudden you've got, if you want to play the pessimist role, you've got a guy who can't stay healthy, 
You've got a guy who's never really done it in the NFL, and you've got two rookies. That's right. your receiving core all of a sudden from a group that looked like it was had the chance to develop into one of the stronger units on the team. Now, huge question marks there. You know, Cole, I thought that uh, of all the guys in the locker room, one of the least likely guys to have an issue like this would have been Ace Sanders, uh, having spoken to him uh, numerous times during the season. But as he said, life comes at you hard, and sometimes you don't handle it very well, and clearly he didn't. The interesting part of this is that is that uh, he has announced that he expects a four-game suspension, which means that he has failed some sort of testing by the league twice. Yeah. Not once, but twice, because the first time they put you in the program, the second time they suspend you for four games. So he gets, uh, he gets let's say, uh, you know, he gets suspended for four games. The other, uh, I thought, bombshell was him saying, I'm not coming to training camp. Yeah. He's eligible to come to training camp. He can come work out with the team. He can, he can still be a part of it. But clearly, I think, and he's not divulging what it is, he, has got, he is going to go to some sort of rehab somewhere. He called it counseling. And, and I can tell you, having been on the conference call, he was, unlike Justin Blackman, he was very contrite, very upfront, um, very remorseful. And um, you, you gave me the feeling that if anybody truly, truly recognized that whatever he did was a mistake and wants to get past it, that he's that guy. Well, and let me let me make uh, the comparison between three different wide receivers who have had issues with the Jaguars. Yeah. R.J. Soward didn't seek out the opportunity to talk about it, didn't hide from it. But when we went to him as a as a as a group in the media, he he told us a story. You know, he lied, lie, fabrication, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Just kind of like kind of like Jimmy Smith, same yeah. thing. Right, Jimmy Smith, uh, yeah. same situation. Uh, Justin Blackman. Right, kind of dodged the thing, blew it off either. like it was nothing. Yeah. Right, it was no big deal. Even though he had a had an issue in college, yeah, and, and we all still knew. said it was no big deal. Yeah, Justin Black, I mean, uh, A. Sanders on the other hand, sought out the opportunity to tell his side of it right out front. Uh, right, as soon as that, it was announced, he that, said, "I want to have a conference call." And right, the Jaguars didn't announced want him. Was, yeah, Jaguars didn't want him to do that, by the way. Well, and by the way, that some of that is part of the way the Jaguars tend to operate right. uh, from a PR standpoint. Um, and, well, and any, it, any, every professional organization these days... That's these days, what I was going to say. It's, this is so to, rare. Right, so tries to manage the news, okay? And, and so we're not singling out the Jaguars, although they sometimes seem more paranoid because we're on top of them every day. But you're right about Ace. And it, it is it is so rare that somebody would do that. My first inclination is to say, you know, if he if he seeks out the opportunity and then starts denying it, well, that's that's a pretty powerful thing. He didn't deny it. He seeks out the opportunity and tries to explain himself and not only explain himself but say, let everybody know I am going to do what it takes to try to get this done. There are no guarantees. If addiction is part of this, as you know, Sam, uh, uh, I think we've all known people who battled addiction through the years. It is you cannot predict how it's going to turn out, but you almost can never assume or can never expect that somebody's going to be an addiction unless they're ready to truly say yes, this is a problem. Yes, I have to do something about it. He's already taken ownership of it, so I'm not sure if it's an addiction thing or if it's a if it's a decision thing, a choices thing. But um, you know, I hope the best for Ace. Uh, he's always been good with me in the locker room. Um, it, you know, you can never tell when somebody's going to have uh, uh, have those issues, and some guys hide it a lot better than others. But uh, this, in terms of what happens on the field now, this really does impact the Jaguars' offense. No question about that. And you know, Cole, you know, we we work in a in a town where um, there's a it's kind of a very cliquish, closed media, you know, kind of thing. And mm-hmm. and uh, I have always tended to operate outside of that. And uh, and I know that you have always been kind of on the fringes you've never been in with both feet so you're going to hear a lot of stories about ace and people reporting on what he said and their opinions about this and that this is one of those situations where you had to be on the conference call you had to listen to it and all the way to the end because a bunch of guys hung up the last thing ace said on that conference call was i appreciate you I was so impressed with that because 
uh, as you said, he met this thing head on, and he he said, you know, I got an issue, I got to deal with it. He didn't want to reveal what it was, and you know, obviously it's something intensely private that he's embarrassed by. But for him to say, hey, I appreciate you, he's, you know, you don't have to say that kind of stuff. No, it's this. It were the kinds of things that. You know, uh, uh, God help us if, if something would happen uh, like this to you and I, or you or I. Right. This would be the way that we would expect to handle it ourselves. Something. I like think that. it would. I think it would be you and I because if I was involved, I'd probably drag it. Down. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm as bad an influence on you as you are on me, but you know. Hey. That's what I mean. <laughs> but uh, but this would be this would be how we would want to handle it, and how you know, listen, we. Uh, right. It's. You, you would hope you would be able to handle that kind of maturity or or apparent maturity. Uh, so. On a scale of 10, how big an issue is this for the Jaguars wide receiving core? Yeah. And what are your expectations of that receiving core going into 2014? Much lower now because I think, uh, you know, when you got a slot guy like he is available uh, to come out, to go in motion, to, to uh, use his speed, to create some matchups with uh, the third cornerback or a safety that that can't right quite handle that, uh, a guy who has a year of experience behind him. Now, you know, Marquise Lee is obviously a tremendously talented player. And um, um, Allen Robinson seems to be that that big, you know, I don't know if he's going to be Demarius Thomas, but he seems to be the in that mold of that, that kind of guy, Demarius Thomas. So, you know, the, the question is, is that, you know, who fills a lot of those holes when you, in your mind, you had him, you didn't have him penciled in, you had him lock stocked in marker in that spot. You know, well, nobody's unless, gonna come and take his spot. Unless the two rookies are terrific, and then you can use Cecil Shorts in, in some uh, combination with maybe, you know, because we talk about the slot guy and we think about the Wes Welker, the little guy, but for a long time, the slot guy was the big slower receiver, right? right. Who, who could go down and, and, and sort of play a, a tight end hybrid type of position. By and the way, it was, one of, it was one of the knocks on Andre Reid in the discussion about the Hall of Fame is that he had 60, 67% of his catches from the slot position. That's a terrible argument against him. Wasn't it terrible? That was I mean, just, I just, I, I, la I laughed out loud when a guy brought that How up. How dare they find mismatches <laughs> for top players? <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, come on, guys. So, so. Uh, but I, I think it's I think it's difficult. I think it hurts. Uh, I think it uh, it takes a position that uh, you thought the Jaguars were on their way to solving, and now puts a big giant question mark on it. Yeah. And here's where the other side of this offense uh, offensive story. We'll get to the quarterbacks in our third installment. But you know, offensive line wise, we think we know. You know, I have a pretty good expectation of what Zane Beatles is going to do with the Jaguars. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have a pretty strong feeling about, you know, the right side of the line. Um, we expect there to be a little bit of a step back from the center position from from Brad Meester in, in the near term, whoever's in there. But Luke Jokel left tackle. Now all of a sudden we're thinking, well, is he going to be back to playing like his, you know, potentially the best player in the draft last mm -hmm. year? Mm -hmm. This is this is another big story that that I'll be following throughout the course of really more the preseason than training camp. It's tough to gauge uh, how a guy's going to do under the lights and uh, you know with guys coming full speed trying to get after the quarterback. But Luke Jokel is a very big storyline for me this preseason. I agree with you, and uh, you know I think he has Baselli like potential uh, on both ends. He could be as good as Tony, and his career could be as short as Tony's. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to me. That's what you're looking for this year. Some guys, Cole, the way they play, where they are, can never get out of the way of being hurt. I mean, and we've seen that in incredibly talented people. They just can't, for some reason, how they play, where they stand, where they are, it finds them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Jokel had just moved over to that left tackle position last year. Somebody rolled up on his, on his leg in the St. Louis game, done for the year. He is an incredibly talented, smart, physical specimen, ideally built and trained for that position. If he stays healthy, it's he's a 10-year cornerstone right there. But, you know, is he, now with one injury, is he the guy that 
that that seems to find all the time, and we'll only know through time. And usually, you'd, you know, ACLs are becoming easier and easier to come back from. Knee surgeries, you know, the technology and the training and the, the rehab is, is so much better. Uh, we understand it more now than 20 years ago. But the other side of this is uh, not only does it change the way he plays, uh, but will it, you know, subconsciously affect him? You know, uh, uh, so there's the physical side, then there's the mental side. And that's going to be an interesting, interesting thing to me to see how he comes back from that. If he can play physically like he did before, and then build on that and get better and better and better. And then mentally, will there be, you know, it, when there's when there's guys in the ground, you know, when there's turbulence, there's guys on the ground and around him. Will he be able to handle it? Uh, you know, will uh, I think t this is a this is only a you know I hate to say this, but only a time thing. Yep. You know, he's you know if he's a guy who plays 16 games and just gets stronger and stronger in each game. I mean, I've seen him uh, like you have, and he looks like he has no ill effects from the injury that he suffered last year. All right, that's uh, the second of our three-part series, previewing Jaguars Camp 2014. Sam and Cole podcast brought to you by Black Creek Outfitters, as always. Follow Sam on Twitter at Sam Kavaris. Follow me on Twitter at Cole Pepper. Next time, is this the year? Will they miss Mojo? And what about the quarterbacks as we continue <laughs> previewing Jaguars Camp 2014 right here on the Sam and Cole podcast? All right, you want to start the third one off? I can't. I'm going to have to go out and do the sports. Okay, let's I'll, let's wait until you get back then. It'll be 11:40. Is that going to be all right with you? Uh, let's do the third one tomorrow. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yeah, I'll be. I'm. Uh, let me think.